Shalom this morning, Friday, Bible study. That's right. As we enter, we want to welcome each and every one of you overseas and locally who are joining us on our Bible study every Friday morning. Head of Jews for Jesus, Australasia, Bob Mendelssohn will do what he customarily does, teach us, and we glean these wonderful truths. Take notes and then join once again in the Q&A at the end of a period of time of study. If you would like to be part of the Q&A and part of the Bible study, don't forget, please, we don't record it. Send us an email at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au and we will send you a link. Now, once again, Bob Mendelssohn, please take it away. Thank you, Jimmy. Thanks, everyone, for being on the call today. This last week, I read the book, The Happiest Man on Earth by Eddie Jacu. He died earlier this year. He was over 100 years old. In fact, he was 100 years old when he wrote the book. An amazing storyteller with phenomenal recall. He was an Auschwitz and Buchenwald survivor and so much more. A mechanical engineer by profession, then later a real estate man. He even ran an automobile. He was an entrepreneur here in Sydney. He was ever a quick thinker and a tough nut to crack. He survived the war, the brutality of the Shoah, and came out in goodness, looking for goodness in others, no matter how much evil and vile horror he experienced. And as he said of himself during the war, that he was too German for the French or the Poles and too Jewish for the Germans. Halfway through his recounting of his experiences of survival in Auschwitz, he mentions these people, these Jewish go-betweens, the hated capos, like the tax collectors in Roman times, only much worse. They would dob in other Jews for any number of non-crimes, and as a result, those criminals were often killed or deprived, and those capos received rewards of food or clothing or other essentials from the Nazis. They were despised by those who were living in the camps. Christopher Wright wrote about the hero of Jeremiah chapter 40, Gedalia, with a very different perspective. Perhaps it's maybe that Wright is not Jewish or a Judean, or that we're two millennia distant from the era about which we're studying. Somehow Wright writes well about this Gedalia while Eddie Jaku writes about those capos as if they are the evilest ever. Or perhaps Gedalia treated the Jewish people differently than the capos did in Germany and in the death camps. That just might be the case. Let's dig into chapter 40 and see what God has to say to us as 21st century people. For those on YouTube who've not yet read this chapter, please pause your playback, read the chapter, and then rejoin us. Thanks. Welcome back. The chapter breaks into three sections. First, Jeremiah is offered freedom in the first six verses, and he takes it. And then in verses 7 through 12, Gedalia is shown to be the servant king over the refugees, and Jewish people from around the entire region hear about and, and report to him. And the third, final section of today's chapter, which is not really the end of the entire story, shows a naive Gedalia disbelieving field reports about a man named Ishmael and the trouble that is brewing. So we've part of a story today, and let's see what we can learn. By the way, feel free to read ahead and be saddened. I'm not even sure why the people who separated the ancient texts divided this one after verse 16, but we'll try to make that determination in due course. Okay, first things first. Nebuzaradan, he was the captain of the army of Babylon, approaches Jeremiah. It's really a shocking moment in military history. Jeremiah has no military status, but is commended by the general, if you will, on the other side, commended for his saying that the only way to win is to surrender. We'll address that idea of surrender in a few moments. Did you see this phrase in verse 1? The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. <laughs> from the Lord? 
The words of the Babylonian general were taken by Jeremiah as from God. That's a smart move. Personally, I get tired of political watchdogs telling me that this candidate or this person holding public office is basically Satan incarnate and that they have nothing to say to us. That kind of binary disregard is not helpful to those who want to have reasonable conversations and it's especially harmful to anyone who's a serious student of the Bible. Remember, God could use a donkey to speak to Bilaam, some say Balaam, in Numbers 22, 23, 24. And the non-Jewish priest, do you remember his name, Jethro or Ruel, who advised his son-in-law Moses in the wilderness about judicial systems? A wise man or wise woman learns from everyone either what to do or what not to do, what to avoid. And I'm especially interested in learning myself in these days. The world is such a mess and we need advice on so many levels. Agree? One more thing in verse one, this release by the captain of the bodyguard was while Jeremiah was bound in chains among the exiles who were en route to Babylon. When I read this, or anything like this, I'm flashing back to the scenes that my wife and I have seen as we traveled in Europe, in Germany, in Poland, by Auschwitz, in Hungary as we stood by the Danube. Now, fairly sanitized scenes where our Jewish people were taken, carted off in packed to the rafters cattle cars, shipped to oblivion, to death camps, to their ending. Imagine, if you will, Jeremiah pulled aside, unchained, released from his chains, and offered individual freedom. He would have had those feelings that I read in Eddie Jaku's book. And I imagine, and I, <laughs> I'm reading another one now, uh, a new one, new to me, another Holocaust book. You think they'd all been written, but they haven't. And every time I read one of these Holocaust books, when someone escaped and others are left behind, I feel their feelings. These are emotions, never easy. And war itself is packed with its own troubles. I imagine Jeremiah feeling survivor guilt, like so many describe after they left the Shoah. The rest of this scene is amazing. Nebuzaradan testifies, I love this, about God being the one who orchestrated the calamity. He calls God Yehovah Elohecha, Yahweh Elohecha, whatever you have or you name that tetragrammaton. God, your God, the Lord, your God. Why didn't he say Yahweh or Jehovah, my God? He's still an observer. He's an interested party who believes in helping out the cause of Jeremiah, but he hasn't owned his own role in the religious program. He even knows the reason for the penalty. Look at it, verse three, because you people, because y'all sinned against the Lord. <laughs> wow, when the unbelievers testify to the faithfulness of the Lord, look what it says, as he has promised, <laughs> and testifies to the sinfulness of the believers, God is seriously at work. I hope you believe that. Verse four, he says, so what's your preference? Uh, do you wanna travel with me back to Babylon? We're gonna ride in luxury. We're gonna have a 747. We're gonna have padded seats in the chariot. I mean, what do you want? I will, he even says, set my eye on you. Uh, remember that idiom we learned last week? Uh, I'll take care of things. I'll, I'll watch. Or do you want to go home? <laughs> do, do, do what you want. Wait, what conqueror gives that choice to the conquered? Only someone who sees a bigger hand in the battle than his own hand. Nebuzaradan is not far from the kingdom, is he? Verse 5, Jeremiah indicated his own desire no, I want to go back to Judah. So Nebuzaradan gave him food, 
arucha, it says, which is a meal, uh, but probably substantial amounts of food and a gift, probably what we would title cash and permission. He gave him three things, food, a gift, and permission to go anywhere he wanted. That's unheard of. That's what some would title favor. Listen to the name of the leader of the Judeans, the mayor, if you will, Gedalia. His name means uh, God is great. How great is our God? He's called the son of Achikam, the son of Shaphan. Who you are is often a direct result of your parentage, your yichus. And Gedalia is the son of Achikam and the grandson of the Shaphan who was involved in the revival of Josiah years before. Shaphan, the good guy, the holy man, has children and grandchildren who are capable and who are responsible. They've earned the trust of others, including Nebuchadnezzar. What you do today, how you behave in front of others, that's going to stay with your family and your progeny in good, well, it's going to stay them in good stead. Your residual life will impact others. That's what I read in Eddie Jaku's book. He's hoping when he shared his story in 2020 that that's going to be pervasive. My goodness, that man weekly ran a... Um, if you will, a testimony. He would share his story at the uh, Sydney Jewish Museum and never failed to impact people. Now, the apostles also taught this. L listen to what the apostle Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 13. Quote, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what's good and you'll have praise from the same, end quote. And, and the apostle Peter said something similar, quote, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation, end quote. Jeremiah packed up, in verse 6, he travels to Mizpah. Now, don't be confused. There are two Mizpahs in the Tanakh. The first one is the one east of the Jordan River and was made famous by Jacob with his uh, father-in-law Laban. And even uh, that, that same Mizpah was in the story of Jephthah. This one, however, is in the land of Benjamin, just a few miles from Jerusalem. Samuel had used this one as a home base of sorts, and there he erected the stone we call Ebenezer. And this Mizpah, the story of the sliced Levitical concubine took place. That's not pleasant, but uh, Saul was chosen king there as well. So this is a good place for Gedaliah to set up his, I want to say military command, but really it's a provisional command. It's really a a food distribution center in and out. Verse seven and eight allow us to see the infrastructure of the command post there in Mizpah. People came from the conquered territories nearby and then they checked in with Gedalia. He takes care of the poor folks as well as the people of note. When I was in Warsaw earlier this year and saw all the flood of the refugees coming from Ukraine, there were posts set up, what we would probably use the, the convention center for, um, as a place of housing, a place of distribution. Um, after hurricanes take place, um, I remember seeing this uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. I was over in Houston, not too far from there, right after Katrina, mm -hmm. And there were, there, they were showing every day on the television all the peoples who were gathered there at the Superdome and other major facilities. And even in Houston, there were major facilities open for housing and food distribution, both income and outcome. So that's what I see with Gedalia there in Mizpah. 
Uh, people like Ishmael, Yochanan, Jonathan, Sariah are all mentioned. And there are individuals who are from the surrounding regions who are named, all seem satisfied. It's not easy to be the replacement leader in a turbulent time, but Gedalia seems to be the right man at the right time, which will make his ending all that much more painful. Verse 9, Gedalia makes an oath. He swears allegiance to these people. Gedalia insists that these new neighbors should not be afraid. I, that is just a beautiful, strong military and mm, psychological and sociological statement. Fear not. Don't fear the Babylonians. Stay home. Gedalia has taken Jeremiah's words as gospel. He encourages the new folks to stay home. Support the king of Babylon. What does he say? That it may go well with you. That, that's what Jeremiah has been saying for, for decades. Do what the Babylonians tell you. If they take you, go. If they say stick around, then stick around. Comply. Gedalia is heard by those who had already remained, and according to verses 11 and 12, other regional Jews from Ammon, Moab, Edom, all came, those are east of the Jordan River, all came to Gedalia. He was offering a sanctuary city, and they took him up on it. Then in verse 13, warnings come. This is unusual. Yohanan comes over, and others come to him, these other commanders uh, and they come to Gedalia, and though he receives the men, he doesn't receive their word of warning. Verse 14, what does it say? He did not believe them. His naivete is visible and portends danger ahead and commensurate sadness. Verse 15, Yochanan privately now, so he does that at the, at the round table, if you will, uh, publicly, we could say, but now he has a private audience with Gedalia, and he offers Gedalia a way for, he says, look, I'll take care of things, so you don't even have to get your hands dirty. It's a remarkable offer, as if Yochanan works for the Jewish mafia. Gedalia, you don't need to do anything except give me permission. I'll take care of everything, but verse 16 shows that the new mayor is preventing the operation from going forward. He not only disbelieved Yochanan, but he calls him a liar. If you've read ahead, you know this is a sad moment when the possibility of cleansing the evil, Ishmael, from their midst is available, but it's knocked back. If you have not yet read ahead, you might actually think Gedalia is a level-headed, reasonable, and virtuous leader. He believes that all the Jews are on side with him and that everyone is to be trusted. But this is a time of war and Gedalia should have done well to listen to his advisors. Don't you reckon? We'll ponder more of that next week. Now, as promised, an excursus about the word surrender. This goes completely against the grain for religious people. It surprised the Judeans when Jeremiah told the good ones that they were rotten fruit and the surrendering ones that they were the good fruit back in chapter 24. Jeremiah had passed that message to Zedekiah, who simply nodded in a gesture of niceness, but didn't regard Jeremiah's words as God's word. What a waste of truth telling. Surrender is communicated in military terms via a white flag. You might have seen that in the movies. And most armies of the world oblige the other side by accepting their surrender. Christian musician Chris Tomlin wrote the song, White Flag, and includes these deep lyrics. Quote, the battle rages on as storm and tempest roar. We cannot win this fight inside our rebel hearts, we're laying down our weapons now. We raise our white flag. We surrender all to you, end quote. I've been a believer in Yeshua for 51 years. And for the first 40 or 45 of those, 
my way of handling sin was by what's called white knuckling, by determination. My commitments to change were what kept me away from sin and sins, or so I thought. But about six or seven years ago, with the help of a Christian counselor, I learned a lot about myself and my own war against sins and how I was not successful in beating sin. Only when I learned that it's not about me or about my religious devotion, about my determination, it's all about surrender to the living God and letting God be God in my life. When I surrendered, or as the Bible calls it, trusted God with my life, that's when victory came. John the Apostle wrote that in his epistle. This is the victory, he said, even our faith. And by faith, he meant surrender to the Lord. When I learned that, and it's late in the game for a believer of many decades, my life changed. Temptation did not have to be met with my power to resist. I could win in this transitory life by letting go and letting God. I imagine some of you hear that as religious cliche, and for that I apologize. But as we deal with sin, looking to the 10 days that start this Sunday night with Rosh Hashanah, and then 10 days later, Yom Kippur, we process how to win, how to conquer sin, how to live a righteous life. The simple answer is, we let God be God. And that's not anything I ever considered in the opening decades of my life. I was raised as an Orthodox Jew. Religion was how I was gonna solve this. But religion was my problem, my action, my performance in, the, in relation to the commandments that God gave us. Only when I learned to trust the Almighty and not to lean on my own performance, only then did I find victory over sin. Not, please, not that I'm perfect or done, not by any stretch of my hopeful imagination. But the more I reflect on the power of the Holy Spirit, on God's grace, on his intention to dwell in me that is in my flesh, then the more I relax, I surrender, I wave my white flag and I let go and let God. The surrender the Judeans made happen when they went along to Babylon allowed their survival for the next 70 years, which actually meant another 600 years and honestly, 2,600 years so far. We are here because some surrendered at the instruction of Jeremiah. That lesson was new, new to me. I'm still learning it today, and I will live in God's plans for me, for my family, for Jews for Jesus, for whoever's listening. If you are not yet a believer today, in a moment, Jimmy's going to offer you a prayer. Please raise the white flag. Trust Yeshua, won't you? Jimmy, let me turn it back over to you. Thanks, brother. Thank you for that word, Bob. And as you said earlier, the opportunity for those who do not know, and we don't assume or presume that everybody does, if you do not know him, that is Yeshua as your Lord and your Savior this morning. Listen, God has reached out with his favor in that in this time of reflection, of hearing the word and knowing that I'm not right. I don't know his peace. I don't know his mercy. I don't know his forgiveness. The day of atonement has been done and taken care of 2000 years ago. Jesus came and he paid for you and for me that if you would trust, put your faith in that finished work, you can be in relationship with him today. So take a moment with me, please. Father, I don't know you as I ought to know. I call you Father because I heard that you are a father and I want to be your son and daughter today. So if you would make that way possible for me and it is in your son, I will put my trust in him and in that work, knowing that my peace and my comfort and my mercy and most of all my sins have been forgiven. What an incredible truth that is. 
Listen, if you've taken a moment in your own words and reached out and asked him that very thing, please let us know at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au and we would love to send you some literature. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to stand with you. These are important days and important times as we take a moment to welcome you into the family of God if you've done just that. I want to say Shana Tova to all of you and Shabbat Shalom and we will see you next Friday for the next chapter. Jeremiah 41. Shalom.